I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show... The essence of TED is that everyone has a message, everyone has something to communicate, everyone has a story. There's communication in every species, but what there isn't in any other species is the ability to build concepts that can then be shared and transferred into other brains and so that we can all build up these worldviews that change our behavior. There are very few things that people can do by themselves. Almost everything that's worthwhile doing has to be done by multiple people with a shared vision. What our brains notice are things that are different. And so that puts constant pressure on innovating and on on finding a way to surprise people. If a speaker shows, I don't know, shows a bit of vulnerability, shows a bit of humanity, shows you why what you're about to hear actually matters. It's going to be interesting. You know, this is a problem I've been thinking about my whole life and people don't normally know it. If you can make people want to open the door and make them curious, then suddenly they will really pay attention. What I say in the book is you can't push knowledge into a brain. You know, it has to be pulled in. Oh my God, I am so excited for this new sponsor, Indochino. Before Indochino, I only had three outfits, but finally I got rid of one and replaced it with a suit from Indochino because... They made me fall in love with the feeling of wearing a made-to-measure suit. Pick your fabric, choose your customizations, submit your measurements. And this week, my listeners can get any premium Indochino suit for just $379 at Indochino.com when entering James at checkout. That's 50% off the regular price for a made-to-measure premium suit. Plus, shipping is free. That's Indochino.com. Promo code James for any premium suit for just $379 and free shipping. Incredible deal for a suit that will fit you better than anything off the rack ever could. And I know this for sure. Chris Anderson, the, I don't know how to describe it. You you wouldn't quite call yourself the owner of the TED Talks, right? You're kind of like... The 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 chief of the TED Talks, the the empire of TED, where thousands and thousands of people speak on important 
relevant topics every year. There's like whatever, 2 billion views a year on the, the videos of these TED Talks or close to 2 billion. And you've also written what I consider to be the seminal guide on public speaking. I always forget the subtitle. Official guide. How about that? The official guide to public speaking. The official guide to public speaking. Thank you. I, I can never, my audience knows this, I never can remember the subtitle of any book. Yes, subtitles hard, definitely. I never remember people's names for what it's worth. So, well, you which is a which is a terrible thing to have. In but I will I will give you I will tell you why. It's because you meet um, twenty thousand people a year or more, a million people a year, and the human brain is kind of meant to meet thirty people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even when I met thirty people, I only remembered seven of their names. So, <laughs> if I I'm, just, into, I'm just bad at it. <laughs> okay, but I'm recognizable. If I bump into you in the street, like you're going to say at least, "Oh, James, you'll yeah, remember that." Either that or, "Oh, Malcolm." No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been accused of that, by the way. Yeah, uh, but uh, that, that's another story. But um, I just want to, I just want to add. Uh, you've done so many things. Uh, you, 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 you know. I used to read back in the '90s, Business 2.0, a magazine you started. You were, you had a magazine empire. Uh, it's so you, the sort of um, capital in one way or the other that you gained from that, both in terms of uh, reputation, money, however you want to put it. You, you ended up buying the TED Talks from Richard Werman, who had started them, and and you, you expanded it just in every way uh, with. You know, thanks to in part to to YouTube and videos, but also with the TEDx and the TED Talks are really the place to go for for knowledge education. I kind of almost, I mean, not almost. I do encourage people. I encourage my daughters to go watch TED Talks instead of going to college. They don't listen to me. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> they, like, they that don't could be dangerous. To me. Yeah, I've I've literally offered my daughter he when I saw the bill for a college tuition, I literally said to her, I will take this exact amount of cash, just give it to you, and we have to watch TED Talks every morning just for one to two hours. And and then you can do whatever you want for the rest of the day. We don't even have to talk about them. And she she has so far refused me. <laughs> Wait, so your daughter turned down tens of thousands of dollars so that she didn't have to watch TED Talks. Exactly, that's, yes. That's, that's, that I have not heard that before. That is bad. Well, well, no, but then the next step I said is, okay, back off from that. I will give you the same amount of money and we could just watch a movie every day, any movie you want. In oh. the first thing in the morning, we watch a movie. And uh, she has so far uh, backed away from that. Wow. Now, I still have time. She hasn't started college yet. I make her an offer a day. <laughs> but I think she's getting so used to saying no to me that it's, it's, it's having less and less effectiveness. Well, maybe we could do a great joint experiment here and see whether that type of knowledge actually works. It would be a very bold experiment by you. But, um, um, <laughs> well, well, right now though, she's 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 refusing me. So I don't know. I need to I need to find a new uh, you know someone someone who's a willing recipient. It's almost like I want to take an unwilling recipient of this uh, the Altature Fellowship, as I call it, and 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 my daughter being the re the unwilling recipient and seeing if. It changed her life, as hmm. I believe it would, in a much more impactful hmm. way than a uh, kind of standardized college education. Um, but I don't know if I'll find this out. Wow. Well, thank you for the welcome. It's very, very nice to be here. And um, and yeah, I'm not the owner of TED. I, the reason that is true is because it's owned by uh, a nonprofit, which I which I set up. So when I when I took it over, uh, I, I bought it actually with a foundation, not not personally. And that was turned out to be uh, a really cool thing. It turned out to have a really great outcome. It's actually the key is one of the keys as to why TED has grown since then. But I am the lucky person who gets to kind of lead the team that runs TED. And um, so yeah, it's been it's been a very 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 fun job over the last seventeen years. I mean, I probably watch TED talks. I can't say every day because some days are busier than other others, but. Probably several times a week. There's so many interesting topics. How many TED, how many talks are cataloged now between TED and TEDx? Oh, um, combined, there's more than a hundred thousand now. Um, most of those are TEDx talks on YouTube. Right. Um, on the official on TED.com, um, there's about two and a half thousand, which are, of which about five hundred are TEDx talks. The rest have been recorded at 
the TED conferences. The diff- people, a lot of people don't know the difference between the two, but the X means self-organized. It's a TEDx event is a self-organized event where we've given someone a license, a free license, to go and do the hard work of booking a theater, recruiting people, booking speakers, putting on a show under the TED format and using certain sort of guidelines. We try and help them make it as good as it can, but they do the work. And, and so that that's often the public face of TED. There are 10 of those events every day now, somewhere in the world. And, um, uh, and so that, that's its whole amazing story. But we don't, we don't directly like, control that. We, we, um, we have encouraged that, allowed that, and it's, it's sort of allowed a thousand flowers to bloom in different cities and so well, on. Well, I think it's a great thing, and, I, and I, I commend you on it because I think, A, the organizers of a lot of these TEDx conferences, many of whom I, I either know or I've met or I've been asked to speak at a lot of TEDx conferences, they, they are very happy with the TED brand on them, and I think that helps them attract speakers, and I think they take it very seriously. And, and, and your guidelines on public speaking, they take extremely seriously. Hmm. Well, that's that's cool. I mean, it's it's amazing because they're held in everywhere from the Sydney Opera House. Or actually, um, TEDx Sydney has now outgrown the Sydney Opera House. They now have like four or five thousand people in an even bigger venue. But then it's right down to a TEDx event in a jail or in a slum somewhere, or in cities like Kabul and Baghdad and so forth. I mean, it's 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 amazing to see it flourish like that. And it's there's I have employed at TED. I've got. 16 people who oversee that program. Mm-hmm. And between them, they somehow are responsible now for three and a half thousand events. That's so amazing. It's, when, so it's, it's great leverage on, like, it's just an amazing model there that it's been thrilling to see take off. Oh my gosh, this 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 there's kind of like 27 directions I want to go. But <laughs> uh, following the cues from your great book on public speaking, I do want to do a through line, which is essentially the kind of essence of TED is that you bring out the great public speaker, but really bottled up inside everyone. Everyone has a message. Everyone has something to communicate. Everyone has a story. And the TED conferences and the TEDx conferences help people bring out that story. And you describe it really eloquently in your book. And I'll destroy this analogy a little bit, but you almost make it seem like it's a magic trick. Like somebody has a passionate vision in their brain and they need to transmit it to the 500 sitting people in the audience. And the only way they're able to do that is essentially with their voice and movements and, and whatever else they do on stage. So it's it's this kind of like brain ESP trick, the, almost the way you describe it in the book. And then the book itself is great because you you are just hardcore. You say, I, as the reader, get the impression you, after seeing thousands of talks, and good talks and bad talks and media, all ranges of talks. And plus you get this, the analysis, oh, well, this talk got a, a 10 million views and this talk got zero views. So you get statistical analysis too. You're able to say, okay, here's what I've isolated out as good pieces of a talk, bad pieces of a talk, what people should think about. And you break it down in every way. Mm. And it's so important because, you know, Jerry Seinfeld has that joke. Uh, people are more afraid of public speaking than death. So they would, they they'd rather be in the grave than giving the eulogy. <laughs> so so, and and I remember the one time, the one time I did a TEDx, uh, I did TEDx uh, San Diego. I I've done I've done thousands of public talks. Okay, but I'm always scared right beforehand. And and particularly TEDx San Diego had thousands of people at it, and I was so scared right beforehand. I. I honestly started crying and I thought I would just leave because the the girl right before me was brilliant. Like she was just <laughs> so amazing. She had uh, a disability that she had grown up with and she talked about how she had dealt with that disability and how she had overcome it. And then, and then there was supposed to be my talk. And then after my talk was going to be the San Diego Ballet. So, uh, so without feeling too competitive with the ballet and this girl who was so sweet and so kind and 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 also describing her disability and so on without feeling competitive with them i thought like oh my god i'm nothing and i'm i'm like a nothing sandwich bracketed by these two amazing you know pieces of bread and so i literally was going to run out of the hall and just cry <laughs> and somehow you didn't right i didn't you well, just about stuck it out they wouldn't let you go they, they probably wouldn't have let me go <laughs> Um, what tends to and what ends up happening with me in a lot of cases 
is uh, I get very nervous right up until I hold the mic and then suddenly a persona develops and I'm able to do it. I don't know what happens. I get like That's a great. boost of energy. But I also find that I, I, I mean, I read your book and I, and I, before your, your book, when I was doing public speaking, I think I instinctively was doing a lot of those things and I kind of mm. corrected myself on some of the bad things. But it's, but I think with public speaking, the more you know, the more you need to learn. And mm. there's always room for improvement. So, so before I drill down on, on all the techniques, I, I just want to describe to you the experiment I've been doing lately, which has helped my public speaking, which for the past five or six months, almost every day, I've been doing stand-up comedy in an, to an unknown, to an audience that doesn't know me at all. Uh, and it's completely changed my public speaking. Wow. Whereas vice versa didn't happen. <laughs> wow. No, that's brave. And uh, I imagine that really would. I mean, people, speaking is so familiar, people definitely forget how much of a miracle it is. Um, I, I really think it is humanity's superpower that we, we can, you know, we can do this. Someone can have, um, you talked about a vision. I mean, the, the currency, I, I see the core currency that is communicated in a, in a good talk is an idea you know, that exists in someone's mind. That, that if you knew what that was neurologically, it would be this really complex pattern, probably involving millions of neuronal connections of some kind. Um, and it is completely amazing that that exact pattern can be transferred and amplified and multiplied, basically recreated in, say, a thousand people out there. Um, I mean, right now, people listening to this, you know, you you and I are saying things with a particular intent and little sound waves are just going into the microphone, you know, down over the internet, whatever, into people's ears. And they have an impact on brains. Your brain, right now, listening to this, your brain will never be the same again because of what you are hearing right now. And to some extent, at least, it will change who you are. And the fact that we can we can do this is is really amazing because other there's communication in every species but what there isn't in any other species is the ability to build something so so you can you can build concepts that build on top of each other and they can then be shared and transferred into other brains and so that we can all build up these these world views that change our behavior you know, it, the fact that someone can invent something for the future, but to achieve that invention, they need other people's help. So what do they do? Well, they talk about it. They somehow get other people to imagine it. And that imagination creates excitement. And then all those people excited join together and they make that thing possible. I mean, that, that is ama an amazing, amazing thing. No one else can do that. And, it's, and so it's, it's really right at the heart of the reason why humans are humans, why progress of any kind is possible, is the fact that we can, we can share these ideas with each other and, and get each other excited about them. And both those things happen in, 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 in speaking. Yeah, and, and, and just to add to that, and I'm sorry if I interrupt occasionally, yeah, I, I yeah, tend to be a, 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 a serial <laughs> interrupter, but um, uh, it reminds me of, it's not just that communicating the ideas, it's communicating them well. Like there's a, there's yes. a talent, not a talent, because like anything, there's a little bit of talent and a lot of bit of skill. Uh, there's a skill to that communication to communicate that idea. Like maybe if I have an idea for electricity and I communicate it to you not so well, your brain only gets slightly rewired. And maybe if the next person is an amazing communicator, your brain gets, oh my God, this is the vision for electricity. And then you, and you look back in time and you see Nicholas Tesla versus Thomas Edison maybe Thomas Edison didn't even have the best solution, but he was an amazing communicator and businessman and, you know, all around almost like a Renaissance man for his times. And he was able to communicate his vision for, for the future of electricity rather than Tesla. And, and that's just one example of maybe a millions where skill and communication change, altered the course of the world. And I don't think people realize for, for even for, whether you're an entrepreneur or a writer or a public speaker, it's this skill is it is the crux of the matter. It's so important for 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 every doing. You have to communicate what you're going to do. Absolutely, there are very few things that people can do by themselves. Almost everything 
that's worthwhile doing has to be done by multiple people with a shared vision. And um, and so, yeah, share that vision. And, and you know, it, it's interesting because, like, l- let's look at the at the through line, so to speak, of your career. You, of course, started uh, Business 2.0. You were involved in many magazines about the future and technology and computing. Um, and like we discussed earlier, that has sort of transformed now into uh, the, all the TED Talks and, it, and its spawns. But TED, of course, stands for Technology Entertainment Design. And I think if you look back to the mid-90s, nobody really knew at that point, was the internet going to be an e-commerce platform? Is this going to be a new medium for entertainment or a new medium for information, all of the above? So all of these things did sort of intersect. And I think you were at the crux of that. And Ted now is at the crux of that intersection because that is still still sort of, you know, uh, con- you know, being born. Right. And the first TED conference was held in 1984, and there, there were, that was the year that the Apple Mac um, was was launched, and it was the year that the compact disc was launched. And, and it's you, no and, and it's no mistake that Richard Werman was a graphic designer. Right. No. In, 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 indeed. And so so right right back then you had um, both those two uh, uh, inventions were. And they integrated technology, entertainment, design in a, in a, in a really sort of um, powerful way. And so that it seemed to the people at that first conference that there was this amazing sort of synergy between the three fields. And everywhere they looked, um, they could see more ways where, where you, could, you could build on that. And uh, I, I mean, I, I first went to TED in 1998, like 14 years later, fell in love with it. Um, by then, it was already starting to branch out beyond those three uh, core fields because the truth about knowledge is that uh, it's it's all connected and you, we've got this weird paradox in the world where on the one hand to get anywhere you kind of have to pick your subject and kind of go deep into it but on the other hand um, if you don't know the broader context if you don't know what other people are doing if you don't know how what you're doing relates to the rest of what's out there you May miss out on on the biggest innovations, the biggest possibilities, and and also the biggest way just to explain what you're doing. So, so th- there is there is enormous power in having at least some communication being across discipline and trying to get people from different fields talking to each other, break down the silos. You know, ideas famously said they they don't come out of nothing. They they you know they mate with each other. They spark multiple ideas come together. They ignite in a brain that is ready and poof, something brand new comes out. But that only happens if that brain is open to, you know, like a really diverse set of stimuli. And, uh, and that might mean watching um, a, you know, a, a software engineer followed by a physicist followed by an incredible musician. And that it's in that mix that something suddenly becomes crystal clear. And so I think I think that was that was what was so thrilling to me was that by day three or four of TED I was having ideas and making connections I never thought would happen um, because of that sort of uh, in just immersing in what other people were doing which I wouldn't normally do in a busy job like it's like I'm not interested in that over two or three days of immersion you find out that you actually you know it's it's really really mind expanding to get involved in multiple areas well well and I think you see this from the perspective of someone who is at the top of the the pyramid there of all these talks. So so you've obviously watched, I don't know if you've watched all the talks, perhaps, but... <laughs> it's uh, not, not all of the TEDx but, talks, but, sure. but many But many people listening, including myself, have watched so many of the talks. And and it's just like you say, and I think this is, this is true in any um, kind of innovative leap in society, it's all about this, this mating of ideas, this idea of sex that, okay, we're going to, talk about design, but also technology. And now we can create not only new works of art on the internet, but new services on the internet, which, oh, is it an artistic medium? Is it a service medium? Is it a commercial medium? And all of these things happen when you combine um, disparate ideas, health, technology, education, and so on. I mean, obviously, um, many people have probably listened to the Sir Ken Rob. Just by the numbers, many people, have, we know many people have listened to the Sir Ken Robinson TED Talk. It's the most popular one, and it's on education. And I love his one anecdote where this girl um, is what we would now classify as 
ADHD or ADD or whatever, and, and schools would instantly give her medication, uh, the, the teacher or the doctor, whoever said, um, no, no, she's just, just get her out of this school and put her in dancing school. And she becomes one of the best dancers ever. And, uh, it's, it's that kind of creativity and new ways of looking at things that no matter how much data we accumulate as a society and kind of outsource our basic decision-making to, we still need, need our own creativity to take us to that next level. And I think listening to these talks help us with that. That's right. And I, and I think creativity is only going to become more important as a human skill. You know, we're, we're it might, be the only, to, it might be the only important human skill after a while. It, w certainly one of the most <laughs> important. Maybe there's other unique forms of human empathy and connection, uh, human service to others, whatever. But but creativity, um, that, that will probably be one of the last things to be truly taken from us by our robotic overlords. <laughs> and, uh, um, all, all, although it's funny, like on, on music... Uh, you can, you know, there's like David Cope, at, uh, I guess that UC Santa Barbara has software where you can't, he could, his software can make music. You can't tell the difference between that and a Mozart piece. And this, so on some levels, creativity is, is trying to be mimicked by, by algorithms. But I think then there's an, always a next level. That, that's right. I, I'm not certainly not saying that machines can't be creative, but, um, um, but humans, humans are remarkably sophisticated it's never a static thing like what what was yesterday's creativity is not today's creativity and i i, I think for genuine i think nurturing creativity is going to be one of the thrilling aspects of of the next couple of decades i think we're going to see an explosion of just amazing aesthetic um uh, ama it, people will be inventing things putting things together remixing in ways that we can't imagine and i think i think um Whatever the machines do, there will be an infinite sort of paint box there for people to get immersed in. So, so certainly, if I was a parent with a kid at school now, having nurturing their creative skills would be would be really a high priority. And hand in hand with that, uh, as as you express in the book, and as many people have expressed, is developing not just a skill, but really a great skill at at communicating. And uh, and I think public speaking, you have to be able to to communicate your idea, your creativity, in a clear, as, as clear a way as possible, and that's ex it's more important than ever. Right. And to be clear, it's not it's not we're not just talking about someone standing on a stage and and saying, "Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me talk to you." It's it could be someone standing in front of their iPhone saying, right. "Hello, hello, YouTube." Um, what have I got for you today? And uh, you know, so there's the, the the art of public speaking is evolving in real time. And, and in fact, the exist the fact that um, great things are visible online is is really accelerating that art. So that people people are getting inspired by how other people are talking and sharing and presenting. And um, it just in the, in the years I've been running TED, I've seen the art, the physical art of standing on a stage, public speaking. It's, it's evolving the whole time. What worked ten years ago probably doesn't may not work the same way now. People have to keep you know moving it forward. Right. So so I want I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the art of public speaking and and how to develop it. And I, I want to address slightly what you just said, which is that people don't realize the competition is not just other public speakers. It's Trump's tweets. It's uh, a song. It's a, a new book by John Grisham. It's it's the 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 eleven billion dollars Netflix is spending on original content for TV shows. So there's a lot more competition for your attention, and that's part of the reason why public speaking has to evolve. And part of the reason why why even though I've done for myself decades of public speaking. I can't stop improving and I'm always nervous and I'm always thinking, what do I need to, to, to do? But let's, so let's talk about it for, 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 for the art of public speaking. Um, and, and again, I highly recommend people read your book, but let's just dive into all, all of the different issues. What, what do you consider is the most, what's the most important for you when you're going up there to public speak? The single most important thing is clarity on, on what you want to say. Like, Often people go and they're interested in lots of things, right? At any one moment in time, you're interested in lots of things. And you think, well, I've got so much time, so I'm going to talk about as many things as I can in that, in that time. Um, that's not the right approach. It's, well, what's an example of that? Um, 
Well, I mean, an example of that might be, um, I don't know, a, a, a scientist coming in and that they've been working on three projects and they try and explain all three, but but no one ever really understands any of them because because they're all a little bit, you know, they all involve too much background to be able to share, just summarize. So the, so the trap that so many speakers fall into is is called the curse of knowledge. And it's that people forget what it's like not to know something. To, to know and understand something takes a lot of context. There's a lot of building blocks in your, in your brain underneath the sort of surface idea that, that, you know, the headline. Underneath the headline, there's, there's a lot of context. And you forget often what's down there. You think that if you just give the headline, people will go, okay, I get it. They won't. So, so, so the, the key with the talk is to cut out two-thirds of the things that you think you want to say and focus on what's left and, and then um, go, go in deeper. And that means doing the following. It means early on you know, giving, giving people a reason to know why it even matters. Why is this an interesting question or problem or topic? Um, and that there's lots of ways that you can do that. You can tell a story about how you got into it. You can just ask the right kinds of provocative questions. But I mean, you have to give people a reason to care about why this thing matters. And then, you know, take people on a journey on like, like a detective story almost of exploring it. You know, is this a way of understanding this? How have people thought about this historically? Um, why doesn't that obvious way of thinking about this make sense anymore? Um, you know, describe a couple of dead ends almost. And, and then give examples about how you have started to think about something. So, so often people will say, here's my idea. And it, it doesn't really land. And the reason it doesn't land is because people can't, you know, it's a conceptual thing. To understand it, people need to know concrete things. How does it actually relate in the real world? You know, and, um, and like, so... Well, what's an example of that? Like, what's an example? So, so, so bridge us between uh, some example, clarity of vision, right. and how it relates in the real world that, right, that, so, that you appreciate. Um, right. So sure. So 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 you know the psychologist Dan Gilbert came to TED, and he wanted to explain this idea of synthetic happiness and that how um, people, even when really bad things happen to them, a few months later weren't that unhappy, and after really good things happened, a few months later weren't that happy. So you could say that, and you've explained the idea, but it hasn't landed. And and the the way he got it to land was to give examples, and he so he quoted. Pete Best from the Beatles saying that not joining the Beatles was the best thing that ever happened to him. And you go, what? And um, or, or he quoted um, uh, a business executive who'd, who'd gone to jail and how that that had actually been been the key, his key to a better life. Or he he quoted stats on lottery winners and paraplegic pe- people who'd lost the ability to walk and people who'd won millions of dollars. And a year later, they're actually both back at the same levels of happiness. So it's, it's, it's those, those examples make what he's saying astonishing and real. And then you think, well, then you really want to know what is the psychological mechanism that is underpinning that? How could that even be? And it's, it's, it's that grounding. And, and, and um, so many speakers make the mistake of just going at the conceptual level. Um, they think that by saying, "Yeah, um, if something bad to you happens a year later, you'll be you'll be just as happy." That doesn't that doesn't convince you. It's, I mean, the, ex- it's the examples that convince you. It, it, it's the examples. I mean, and, and it's funny. You break out in your book. You break out the difference between examples and storytelling. But of course, examples are a type of mini stories. So he has kind of yes. the cl- the overriding clarity. He wants to explain a co- a complicated concept. So he gives a series of many examples to trigger your curiosity and then he's able to dive now that you're on the edge of your seats oh how, what, what's going on? i want to be like pete best and be okay with the bad things in my life right uh he, he, he's able to then take you take right. you to the finish line Where, whereas he might have also said uh when i was uh, six years old, I I lost a leg. I mean, he didn't, but right. just, you know, he, he might have also taken you on a journey, which was uh, the arc of the hero. And, and and but I'm just as happy now, according to the F, the MRIs and whatever. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, a st- an example is a story. Um, it, th- those terms can be are often interchangeable. In, in the Ken Robinson talk, you just talked about what you remembered from the talk was 
a story. Right. You know, if Ken Robinson had just said, I'm really worried about the loss of creativity in schools, no one would have remembered the talk. The fact that he made everyone laugh hysterically for <laughs> 18 minutes and then gave this extraordinarily moving story about Andrew Lloyd Webber's choreographer as a girl and you know, everyone remembers that story and it rams home the power of his point that the school system almost had this tragic outcome that this 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 young girl never found her destiny. Well, well, uh, it's almost like there's a, I mean, not almost, there is sort of a, a, a neurology to storytelling. Because if you think yes. about it, how did, and Yuval Harari talks about this in Sapiens, how did we, this sort of wimpy, uh, you know, species in Eastern Africa without any hair and not big teeth and we weren't that large or anything, how did we, you know, conquer the world essentially and spread all over the place, the only species to do so. And his argument is that somehow or other around 70,000 BC, the brain developed the ability to believe in stories. And so mm. then that you could share them generation by generation to communicate ideas that are right. important, like this area is safe, these people are good, these people are bad because of this God. And mm. and that's how we, we win. So it's built into the brain somehow, it, this, this sort of rewarding of a good story. Yeah, I think it was probably an unintended consequence of inventing fire and controlling fire. And that and that, that started like a million years ago, but over hundreds of thousands of years, humans, instead of going to bed as soon as it got dark, had this technology that allowed them to stay up later, scare off wild beasts, stay warm, and and they built social bonds. And they they, I guess, you know, you can imagine it all, drumming together, dancing together. And then um, slowly, communication and language developed, and it's it's this miracle that someone could stand up on, on a fireplace and look at everyone else and start talking, and people's minds started m melding and sinking with that person. And and it, I, I really think it's key to hu humans' ability to cooperate and so forth. And storytelling was it, it's in every culture, and it's the simplest and most potent form of communication because what what that allows it, it allows all the listening brains to just imagine the circumstances of the speaker and feel what that speaker was feeling and and so you know whatever the story i was going you know through the jungle being pursued by this beast and then i dodged and found this river and escaped in the river you can you can kind of imagine that and picture that and, and that story has given you useful information Next time you're chased, you think, wait, maybe there's a river somewhere I can escape to. You know, so so actually, and it's a safe way to get that information, um, as opposed to, let's say, many other species have to actually experience exactly. a bad thing repeatedly to then avoid it. Someone could listen to, oh, don't drive 160 miles per hour while drunk, because this is what happened to me. I lost both my arms and legs. That's right. A and now the listener could say, okay, I'll, I'll never do that. <laughs> exactly. So 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 you can definitely make a case that. Storytelling had a, had a had a literal evolutionary um, consequence that we that we co-evolved with storytelling. That great storytellers and great listeners had an evolutionary advantage, and 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 that is why stories have become more and more important to us, and 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 um, they consume us in in many ways, and they've led to all these other unexpected benefits of being able to share ideas. You know, it's interesting because you mention. I, I, didn't, I don't remember if you mentioned specifically the fire concept because that's fascinating. But you did you did quote, uh, I believe, a, another TED speaker talking about the difference between what we discuss in the morning versus what we discuss at night. So in the morning, we'll discuss like issues and I don't know politics or what's on the morning shows or whatever. And at night, uh, we go into storytelling mode and we dance yeah. and we and it's a little bit more entertainment focused. But again, even even things like dancing or performance or storytelling. All of these are safe ways to kind of mimic dangerous things that happen in the jungle, and and we able, are able to resolve that tension in our bodies through this this entertaining medium that that our brain rewards, and the, and the better storytellers get rewarded in so many different ways. Now it's it's I mean it's mm. it's you can see how they're rewarded. That's right, and it's it's a short step from there to dreaming together, planning together. Um, but um, from the point of view of public speaking, what, what the key thing to remember is that this storytelling is, de is a deeply primal human thing. When you, when you tell a good story, you're tapping into something that's, that's 
tens of thousands of years old. And um, and and so yes, um, uh, you uh, you use them. I think I think occasionally speakers are great storytellers, and that's all that they are. And there's like the stories are always entertaining um, and gripping. I love even more stories that are entertaining and gripping and are, are told in service of an idea. You know, there's something that you learn from it in the process. Well, and, I think I think if you look at like a movie, um, you know, if nobody, so let's just take Schindler's List as an example. I'll take the most extreme example: uh, gripping story from beginning to end. Um, every has all the characteristics of a great story, and and of course Steven Spielberg's one of the great storytellers of of all time. But of course, you you learn the the viewer learns many things, and the char- the main characters learn many things during the movie, and mm. the viewers learn many things during the yeah. movie, and that makes Schindler's List maybe the best movie of all time. That's right, but and and uh, unfortunately, a lot of speakers make the trap of. Not doing that. So, so one of the main reasons we turn down speakers at TED, I would say, is that they they want to come and just tell their story, and they they you know they they've done a few interesting things. They're a good storyteller, but there's no there's no gift in it. It's kind of self serving, right? Um, it's it's I'm so interesting on stage, you know. Let me tell you about another cool thing I did, and and um, and they're forgetting what what I think is the core idea of of a great talk, which is. It's it's supposed to be a gift, it, you know. Mm. You're supposed to be giving something to the audience, and they, you've got this chance to for for hundreds of people to walk away, never quite being the same again. And they will, if that happens, they will always remember you that you that you that you gave them something that they could use in their lives. So so telling stories in service of an idea, in service of a gift from you, the speaker to the audience. I, I think that's a really important principle for a great talk. I, I love the idea that the idea is the gift and the stories are in service of the gift. So can I give you an example to, and you can tell me if this is the an analogy for what you just said. Sure. So Ted Williams is one of the you, you you're not from the US, so I don't know, I'm assuming but I'm still assuming you know who Ted Williams is. One, I, I love his name. Okay. <laughs> he, he he's one of the greatest baseball players of all time. He wrote a book called The Science of Hitting. He's I think he's the only or one of the only baseball players to bat over 400, 40% mm-hmm. of his hits made it. And so it, he wrote a book called The Science of Hitting, which explains how he did it. So, by the way, I'm not a baseball fan at all, but I love that he wrote this book. And he basically um, describes for this type of pitch, and you think it's, and he draws like an outline, uh, like a box of where it could, the ball could end up hitting. Here's how he's going to swing the bat, and he kind of gives examples and and draws pictures. Uh, so that's telling an important idea for anybody who wants to be a great baseball player. This is the greatest hitter of all time. He breaks it down like a science. He tells you exactly how he does it. Given this pitch, hit like this. Given this pitch, hit like this. So that's the, the that's the that's the gift. But stories in service of the gift might be: Look, when I was nineteen, I used to swing at the ball like this, and I'd foul it every time, and the audience would boo. And so finally, at, I was at up all night, and I had my daughter pitching to me, and she was only four years old, and she was crying, and I realized uh, she kept throwing it down because she's little, and I realized, oh, I gotta hold the bat this way. Then that's the story in service of how he learned each. Thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That that would be a great um, example, great metaphor. And there, you could imagine a great baseball player writing a book that was was really just designed to boost their own ego, and um, they actually didn't want to reveal all their secrets to <laughs> to the world or whatever. And um, they just wanted to people to think how cool they were and how they'd battled the odds and all the rest of it. And and actually they. They weren't interested in giving away something that someone else could use. So, um, uh, but but in his case, uh, he didn't do that, and that's great. That's that that it, that was a gift. Yeah. No. He. Uh, I mean, just from what, the little I know, he loved the science of hitting right. so much. That he would took thousands of pages of notes and diaries and journals and compiled it into a very slim book. But he wasn't a storyteller. So mm. he did have this incredible gift that he wanted to share humbly, mm. um, and but he did not. He wasn't a storyteller and was not able to uh, kind of express the story of his love for huh. hitting and and why he did this and so on. 
Well, in that case, that might also be a tragedy because you need you need both. Like you need. You need the information there, but you need to present it in a way that is really is accessible and that, that people get and people want to spend time immersed in. But I, I love how you just said, basically, gift minus stories equals tragedy. <laughs> so so let's, let, let's, let's dive into that a bit because obviously then we don't want tragic things to happen. We do not. Well, what's, all of the time, people talk about a great story is is the the arc of the hero. So like Star Wars, Jesus, you know, Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. And, and, and the analogy that I've seen many people make, and I kind of agree with this, is that this arc of the hero should not just be in a great book or a religious text or a movie like Star Wars. It needs to even be in a scientific paper. It needs to be in a public talk. It needs to be in a stand, in a one-line joke. Uh, so, so maybe from your perspective and what you've seen across these thousands of talks and stories that are that are publicly given, um, what to you is is the arc of the story? What are the parts of a story that make something great that people often forget? Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. You know, I never thought I was going to wear a suit again. I used to wear a suit uh, when I went on TV news shows and things like that. And then I just, I got rid of all of my suits. But now, Indochino has changed my mind. I'm seeing suits in an entirely new light. Let me tell you why. It's because it actually fits. Most suits go by a generic size chart. Small, regular, large. What's regular anyway? When you put on a suit that's made to measure something that actually fits your body, it's life-changing. Indochino invited me to their beautiful store. They have a bunch and two in New York City. I went to the one on Broom Street and they measured my chest for me, my arms and my legs. But thank goodness, I'm not ticklish. I'm a professional. The point is this. Indochino is making it easy to get a perfectly tailored suit at an incredible price. Here's how it works. Visit a showroom or shop online at Indochino.com. Pick your fabric, choose your customizations from lapels to pleats to jacket linings and more. Submit your measurements, place your order, and just wait for it to arrive in just a few weeks. I really recommend if you've never had that experience of wearing a made-to-measure suit, then just consider giving it a try now because the feeling is amazing. It really is different. And this week... My listeners can get any premium Indochino suit for just $379 at Indochino.com when entering James at checkout. That's 50% off, half off the regular price for a made-to-measure premium suit, which is a really, really great deal. Plus, shipping is free. That's Indochino.com, promo code James, for any premium suit for just $379 and free shipping. Incredible deal for a suit that will fit you better than anything off the rack ever could, ever would, ever should. What are the parts of a story that make something great that people often forget? The types of stories that I'm most interested in are stories that are in service of an idea. I mean, the the term for that is, um, or that I use, is parable. And I, I don't mean that just in the religious sense. Sure. That's how it's most most often used. But it's it's a story told where where if you pay attention to it, you will you will learn something from it. And and I think sure. I mean most you know there's mo- most stories um, you know have a protagonist who goes through faces some kind of challenge and then it's resolved. I mean that Ken Robinson story you told was was ex- an exact you know example of that. Of here's a girl she's suffering at school. Um, nearly a disaster happens, but then she goes to dance school, and there's a sort of triumphant ending. And, it's, and that's uh, similar to the examples that uh, uh, Dan Gilbert does as well, because they're like mini stories, again in service of this higher idea. So in Ken Robinson's case, the the revolution in education or what needs to happen. In Gilbert's case, the idea of what is synthesized happiness. And then there's the different example, which is the entire through line. Uh, a story goes through the entire through line. Right. So I mean, I think I think to tell a story effectively, you know, that, that you need to, the context needs to be set up so that people can understand the parable part of it. They can understand why you are telling the story, and 
often you, you just you know you need to pay attention to which parts you can which parts are actually necessary sometimes when you hear people tell stories um they just they go on for f- far too much length about pieces that were only in, of interest actually to you and your friends and sister and and not to the rest of the world and they're and not necessary for um the communicating the idea behind the story so okay. hence, so hence the need for development of skill of storytelling it, 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 exactly just of of being of putting yourself in the audience's shoes is this really like is what's the key way to make this story land so that every part of it is is effective and um uh, and if you know so so it's not even though stories are the easiest part of a of a talk to give if you're a speaker because it's you don't lose your way. Like everyone can remember a story that, that there's a, that, that because your brain is reliving a sequence of events, it doesn't forget. You know, like you go, uh, you, you, no one loses that a talk at that moment. It, it, it's, it's true. It's just like I always forget <laughs> subtitles, but I'll remember a story. Uh, the story in the book, in between right. the page, in between the covers. Right. It it exactly syncs with how our brains are sort of structured, and 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 um, so so all that is easy. But people, um, so where it goes wrong is just that you. You forget a key piece of context that was actually needed for the story to land, or you just pump in too much detail that just actually isn't needed for the 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 idea that you're really wanting to, people to focus on. But if somebody's putting too much detail in, two things are happening. One is they don't realize this is a weakness of theirs; otherwise, yeah. they wouldn't do it. And the other is they don't know how to eliminate the detail. Right. So, so how can you? So one way, of course, is with a coach or an accountability partner, but sometimes that's that's difficult. You just need you actually just need a, an honest friend um, who 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 is roughly represents the type of demographic or whoever's in the audience, and you try every talk. You should try it out on people. It's amazing to me that pe- people do not bother to rehearse talks. You know, musicians rehearse like crazy. Um, ath- athletes practice. It, a talk is really important. It's more important than most things you do, and people don't. Rehearse it and don't try it out, and and that's because I think it's because there's social awkwardness in doing it. Just even in giving a, a practice talk to a friend, there's a yeah, little it bit of stress. Feels weird, by the way, weird. to talking to one person like in a yeah, talk. Yeah, it does. But 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 um, and and I, I I feel stressed out doing it. But every time I force myself to do that, um, to just sit down, whether it's with a few colleagues at work or whatever, it's okay. Here's where I'm at so far. This this probably isn't very good yet, but let me try it. You learn so much about, and and then you know. So so ask the specific questions. Did I? Where did I go on too much? What wasn't clear? Um, where did you get bored? Uh, uh, how, how you know is my tone sounding okay? Sometimes when people speak, they kind of go into a oration mode where they suddenly think they have to be grandiose um, instead of just being conversational. You know, the, the the feeling you want when you're giving a talk is as if you're at dinner with a great set of friends and you're just sharing with them something that you're passionate about. It's that conversational style is, so, so, is so, what so, you want. So it's interesting because so not not only the structure of the story where we kind of initially where, where my question was initially going, but but really um different aspects of the delivery, like like the cadence and the rhythm and, and so on, these are are instrumental to the to the storytelling. Yes, they 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 are. I think you can think of your voice as as punctuation. Um, mm. It's it's amazing how many different things a voice can do. You know, high and low, slow and fast, um, pauses, uh, changes of pace, um, emphasis, and and people. You can actually, when you listen to someone's voice, you can you can intuit what they're feeling. Um, you can tell when someone's uncertain. You can tell when they're really passionate. You can tell when they're that teared up, and actually, you mentioned that in the book that very a very small percentage of telling how someone is feeling is communicated through the words, and much more is communicated through uh, intonation, body language, and so on. Yes, yes, on what they're feeling, not in terms of content. There's feeling. a whole, there's actually there's a whole school of public speaking advice which it, which has done a terrible disservice, which is. Focused on um, has misunderstood a, a piece of research that was done in the sixties, and so it tries to say that only a tiny part of communication is through words. It's mostly 
uh, body language and uh, and tone of voice and so forth. And that that is just that is dead wrong. But feeling um, being such an important but, part of that communication, at least there's a that component. That is communicated, and uh, absolutely that is that is communicated. So yeah, so, so so what you do with your voice while you're speaking certainly matters, and. The main, the main thing not to do is to put people to speak. Like so many people speak, every sentence has the same intonation, and then they have they have the exact same pause between each sentence, and they go on with the next voice, and it ends the same way again. And when you repeat that a hundred times, everyone is asleep because it's hypnotic. Um, whereas some things in a talk are exciting, some are light weight, some are storytelling and have a bit of pace to it. You can accelerate a bit. Some really matter, and so you change your voice, and it and it and it really helps to do that and to pay attention to that, and not just it, it's 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 a trap to think that you know you're like you're just reading a speech or something like that. Um, that that's an awful waste of of one of the key tools of giving a talk. Well, I think I think um, that's obvious, right? So anybody who has read a speech versus gone up against someone who's Telling a story realizes right. the the difference, um, but and I and I think even taking it a, a step further, if you're telling the story and you're acting out as opposed to telling the story, you act out the roles. Like uh, my dad then told me, and then act out, you know, <laughs> you know, James, you better not do that again. And okay, daddy, uh, like, <laughs> see, you naturally laugh, like when uh, when I do voices, <laughs> like, but be careful with it, like you have you have to be able to pull that off. Like, there's there's um, this is something to test against. This is a, one reason why you need an honest friend, because we've had people come to TED and try and give a talk and put on little accents and all the rest of it, and they they think they're God's gift to the public speaking universe, and we're all. <laughs> Cringing, and you have to get it right, right? So, like, like with anything, there's the skill factor. There's the skill factor, and and it's interesting to me though that given that everything is so primal, how vast and wide, and like you said earlier, ever changing, um, that skill factor is. Like you would think, after a quarter million years as a species, we'd all probably be in a pretty narrow range of skill on something that's so critically important to our survival as a species. But in fact, we're, we're not at all. No, indeed. I mean, what our brains notice are things that are different, and so that that puts constant pressure on innovating and on on finding a way to surprise people. Do you think? Do you think that also puts a negative pressure because you don't want to be different to be kicked out of the tribe? You don't want to be different in a bad way because then you might get kicked out of the tribe. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. I think I think it can be scary, and a lot of people therefore want to play it safe. Sure, I definitely would encourage people to. Be ready to take risks, but I'd also encourage people to test it out in an audience. Don't don't make your first experiment with you know eight hundred people with with your reputation at stake. It's just it's worth it's worth the effort to um, to try something out first. So so you know another thing you mentioned um, you mentioned throughout the 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 book and you allude to here is part of storytelling is is also likability. People kind of have to like the person they see on the stage. They've never seen that person before, perhaps, but you kind of have to, within a few seconds, even get them to like you. And that could be, uh, you know, smiling at them. That could be uh, expressing a vulnerability or getting them to express it. You have an example where the the um, speaker got them to um, uh, uh, confess to being stressed in many situations or not. Um, so, what, what what are kind of like your tips for like that fast likability? Yeah, it's 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 maybe not just likability. It's it's what what you have to get to is where the audience is wants to go on this journey with you. So they may not like you in the sense that they'd want to I don't know date you or have a drink with you, but they want to be intrigued by you, and they 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 you want them to trust you enough to open up their minds and give you a chance to put some of your ideas in there. Um, it's no surprise that people are naturally skeptical about strangers words i mean you know we we've all taught this right like if you, if we believed everything we heard we'd we'd um, our lives would blow up very quickly and so th- there's all my, these my life has blown up very quickly <laughs> believing everything that i've <laughs> that i've heard it took a long time to not to stop believing uh, everything i've heard skepticism really matters and and uh, and so early on in the talk you need to be careful not to trigger those those responses of shutting down the 
you know, the doors. And the worst thing that happens is someone comes on, their ego on full display, they sound like a blowhard, you can tell that they have an agenda. And chuck, 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 you can kind of hear the audience doors shutting, slamming shut in their brains, and nothing, nothing will actually, nothing of value will actually be communicated. So, so early on, if a, if a speaker shows, I don't know, shows a bit of vulnerability, shows a bit of humanity, sh- t- shows you why what you're about to hear actually matters. It's going to be interesting. You know, this is a problem I've been thinking about my whole life and people don't know, normally know it. So I'm going to take you, I'm going to open the secret to you. Now you've got to make, if, people, if you can make people want to open the door and make them curious, then suddenly they will really pay attention when you say, okay, so it was this thing that got my attention and changed forever how I think about this, this issue. Can, can I share it with you? Let me share it with you. And, and that... So, so what I say in the book is you can't push knowledge into a brain. You know, it has to be pulled in. And so the, your first job is to create that desire to pull. You know, that, that sort of, okay, give me, give me, give me more. I'm here, I'm with you, this is cool. And, um, and there's lots of different ways to do it. You know, it's not, some people start with an endearing anecdote of some kind. And, you know, some, you know, you make people laugh. If you make people laugh, that brings with it an inevitable kind of opening up. But not everyone can do that. So maybe it's just, it's sparking the right kind of curiosity. Have, have you ever wondered why this happened? It's been bugging me forever. I, could we think about that together? You know, like get spark that curiosity. That may be enough to get people to want to come with you. You know, it, it reminds me of, uh, I'll maybe mispronounce his last name, even though he's, he's been on this podcast several times, but Dan Ariely's, uh, uh, talk and his books and and everything and where he basically you know he's experienced massive burns uh and when he was a teenager and so he was he was dealing with the, the massive pain of whether a nurse should rip off the bandages they whenever they changed the bandages they would rip them off either fast or slow and mm-hmm. he wanted to know what was better mm-hmm. and that's kind of how he starts things off and you really you're in it with him you want to know too right exactly exactly and, and that's extreme vulnerability because you're also looking at him and it's not that he's bad looking, but you see that he's he's experienced this trauma and you want to you feel for him and you want to know for him and for yourself too because you could always picture yourself ha- this happening too. That's right. So so yeah, so it's, it's a little bit of human bonding at the start of the journey together through through your talk. Yeah. And so and so okay, so so part one is kind of that vulnerability or that, 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 that bonding, some way of, okay, now I've established this connection to your brain so that the magic trick can begin. Exactly. <laughs> you know, what's, what would you say is uh, step two? And again, by the way, I, this is all in your book, but right. I, I, it allows me, it gives me a chance to, to, to drill on, uh, right. on the master on, on all of these different ideas. Well, so, so let's say that what you're trying to do is to build this um, complicated pattern called an idea inside someone else's mind. The only way you can possibly do that in a limited time period is to use building blocks that are already in their minds. Um, mm-hmm. You can't build the whole thing from scratch. So, you know, you assume that they speak the same language as you, and <laughs> each one of those, each word that they know, has with it a series of concepts and and. So, so the the key is to have a sense of where the audience's start point is. So many talks go in and use a piece of jargon or a piece of knowledge that that, that the listener doesn't know what to do with. Um, so, so I talk about what's an example. Well, so, you know, um, a, a software engineer might come in and and um, talk about code branching on and, and you know whatever, and some, and everyone's going, okay, I'm gone. Um, you 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 have to have a sense of where the audience is, and it's and often this means just test again, just testing out a talk. But explanation means creating concepts one one step at a time. I mean, in the book I talk again about that that um, the Dan Gilbert talk explaining synthetic happiness. You know, where he 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 started out by giving this concept of an experience simulator. And, um, and people know what a simulator is, what a flight simulator is. And so they can kind of get what an experience simulator is um, by, by analogy. And from that was one of the key sort of concepts that he needed to get to explaining 
synthetic happiness. And it was a series of blocks put together one on top of the other where, where you kind of get where he's, he's going. In, um, um, in a talk we had about CRISPR, um, the, the key explanation for CRISPR, which is, you know, it's a complicated piece of science, it's a really important piece of science um, because of, 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 of its implications. But, can, can, can you describe but, what CRISPR is? But, so so this, is, this, is, this was the explanation. It, was, it is a word processor for gene editing. So you know what a word processor is. That's an existing concept in everyone's mind. If, if it wasn't, by the way, if no one had ever knew what a computer or a word processor was, the explanation would fail. But if people know what a word processor is and they know what a gene is, then a word processor for gene editing that tells you, okay, I get it. You can cut and paste genes to make them be whatever you want. That's what CRISPR allows you to do. It actually uses bacteria to cut and paste um, elements of DNA into different parts. And so it gives you at least an intuitive sense of what, what CRISPR is and what the power of it is, because you know what the power of a word processor is for, for writing. And, um, and, and, and that, that so, so a lot of explanations depend on choosing the right metaphors and making sure that the concepts are introduced in a sort of logical order where you, know, you need one to build up the next. And it's, it's hard for speakers to do because of this curse of knowledge. You, know, you, you forget what it was like not to know what you know. And, and so certainly if, it, if you're trying to explain something difficult, you just need to really pay attention and go through multiple versions trying to say, is, is every step of this really clear? And we certainly spend a lot of time with, with, with speakers trying to encourage them to say, you know, this particular part of what you say is underexplained. Um, we need a little bit more of that. That, by the way, you're going on too much. You know, like it's giving that kind of feedback is... is um, it's really hard to do individually, and 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 you know how important is it? And again, I'm thinking again the the, the classic arc. How important is it after you? So 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 you've established this bonding. You're 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 kind of um, like you say building using the building blocks that are already in the audience's head, so that, that they're able to kind of build with you. Uh, how important is it then to keep bringing back, not necessarily vulnerability, but like. And then I had this problem, and then I had an even more difficult problem, and then they cut off my funding, and I had nowhere to go. Yeah, I mean, look, every every talk is different, and the the last, the, 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 actually, the single biggest message of the book is that there is no formula to public speaking. It's it's you don't the, that's the last thing you would want. Otherwise, life would very quickly get boring. Um, you want you want a thousand different approaches to speaking. So so. That there's there's just tools and explanation is a, is a key tool. Storytelling is a key tool. Um, some some talks sure have a have a, a story that sort of builds throughout the whole talk. It may just be your own journey of discovery um, that you take people on. Um, other talks not so much. You know, you you tell a story and then you move on and and explain the idea itself and where it's where it's heading. Um, I mean, there's a th- there's a thousand different types of talks. So so outside of the storytelling. I get on the stage. I've got my idea. I've got my my story, and I'm I'm feeling pretty good about it. And I've I've got my my voice and and, and what I'm going to do with it. How important are things like, um, you know, moving around the stage, trying to establish eye contact with the audience, maybe even engaging with the audience, which is a little riskier. Uh, doing power poses, as Amy Cuddy suggests in her famous TED talk. Uh, uh, what what are what are other aspects that people should at least keep in mind on on a checklist? <laughs> I think the power poses were probably for before the talk to <laughs> to sort of you know feel <clears throat> get the um, which work. by the way Monica Lewinsky says in in your book she, she says, did she says to you that she did power poses with Amy Co- Cuddy coaching her on them that's right before the talk <laughs> you know it's work, work off some of the adrenaline and um, yeah uh, and and. It's 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 a it's a good technique for fighting nerves. Let's say, on stage, there's there's no right there's no single right answer. I mean, the 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 one trait that you sometimes see speakers do that you wish they wouldn't is sort of shift from side to side rhythmically. They shift from one leg to the other, or they step forward, they step back, they step forward, they step back. It's a, it's a sort of they're fighting nerves there. There's sort of a little physical tension in their body, and they're without knowing it, they're sort of fighting that. And it that sort of repetitive movement feels a bit hypnotic. So. When you see that, um, the advice is just hey, just breathe a bit, just stay still. You know, let your feet be still on the stage. 
move your upper body, sure, to express, but but the simpl- the simplest way to give a talk is just to have the lower part of your body still and anchored, you know, on the stage, and then your upper body is is uh, flexible and mobile. You can move around. You look at diff- look at different people, but it's also other people are comfortable walking. If you walk, that's great. Um, it makes sense from time to time just to stop for a moment for the key points, and uh, they will have, actually have added emphasis that way. Eye contact absolutely is important. This is um, this is like one of the fundamentals of human to human communication. We our, our eyes do a thousand things when we look at another human. You know, they are our empathy builders. They are our bullshit detectors. They are we see what someone is feeling and you can you can you can just tell so much by looking at someone and so so if you are not looking at individual members of the audience but kind of giving the talk with your eyes sort of rolled up into your head or looking out over the some sort of you know middle space above the audience's heads um or or looking down into your notes the whole time um that's disconnecting that's really missing the chance for the talk to land this this is a bit tactical but Sometimes the lights are such that you can't really see yeah. the eyes of the audience. That's and that's a terrible mistake by aud- uh, event organizers. We've sometimes done that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the lighting designer has lights at the back, and they want to light up your face with a video camera, and so it's dazzling. You that that's just a terrible uh, way to do it because speaker audience connection really matters, and so. I think it's okay if you're in that circumstance. I mean, it's something to talk about before with an event organizer. It's okay to ask for house lights to be brought up a bit so that you can see people. Um, and uh, but better yet, you know, tr- try and test out what it's going to feel like on stage before you actually give the talk. Mm-hmm. But I but I think giving you know giving one sentence to someone when you do that. Everyone else in the room can see that you're doing that. They can see that you're making human eye eye contact, even if you're not making it with someone else. They they can see that you're connecting with someone, mm. and that's a, that, that's actually an interesting little technique. Yeah, it it, like it, it it is, and it's and and the trap. The reason why a lot of people struggle with this is because they don't know their talk adic- adequately. Well, they're spending too much of their cognitive load trying to remember a talk, and so. A talk wants to feel like it is being delivered in the moment. That people want to feel like you are thinking it through and that you're saying what you mean in the moment with passion, not that you're reciting. So if you're going to remember a talk, you have to really know it so well that you're not struggling to remember it. And that way you can you can look around at someone and just smile at them and say in the moment, you know, this this is why I'm passionate about this one point right now. Would you would you uh, go one step further, which is kind of engage and ask a question. Like, do you do you see what I'm saying? Or you 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 can do that. You can do that. It's it's um, it's a bit riskier. Yeah, it's 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 riskier. And with a recorded talk, it it may not work. But I actually think some a, a lot of great speakers do do that and and get energy from the audience that way. I mean, I got an extreme um, examples like Tony Robbins certainly gets. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's been on, he's been on the podcast. He yeah. has so much energy. He was right at, at in this studio. Uh, we actually made an animation about it. He had so much energy, like the table and the microphones were shaking. <laughs> so the audio engineer had to come in and say, "Hey, love the passion, the, but we can't you can't hear everything." So you know, he came to TED and gave a talk. And um, it was actually one of the first six that we posted. And I would say the first five or six minutes of the talk, you know, were okay. You know, they were fast. They were sort of fast moving. You know, he was trying out. He doesn't usually do that much with slides and stuff. There were sort of slides going. It was his TED thing. Um, It wasn't spectacular. It was sort of okay. And then, you know, he he started asking the audience questions. And... um, um, and he he asked you know a question about what has been an impediment in your life, and Al Gore, who's sitting in the second row, goes the Supreme Court, and uh, and so he and so he says yeah that was great that was a great line and then he, and then he comes back to him and says but you know what if if you ch-, he he starts talking about the power of emotion he said 
if you'd shown half the emotion you showed yesterday when you spoke, you would have won that damn election. And the whole room erupted and 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 he's and he was saying thank you for your energy to to Al Gore and, and so that interchange transformed that talk and and from the rest of the talk he was he was on fire and so yeah he what, and, what, did, what did you see as different for the rest of the talk like is it the how people perceived him or or did he actually act differently he 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 was no longer going through his shtick he was communicating from what he really meant and. Um, and it's, He's it's connecting a, to something a little deeper, as opposed to the stopping at the prepared yeah, moments. Yeah, I think I think because he had seen where the audience was, um, he 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 was just in a different place. I mean, he's he's definitely you know on a different level to m- m- most of us. Um, um, there, there are very few speakers who can do what he can do. I certainly can't. And, and he's um, a professional speaker. Yeah, no, he's 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 professional, and so he he feels where an audience is and can tap into it. But but it was that was certainly very cool to see. Yeah, no, that I I remember that interaction actually. <laughs> it's funny because it, it's funny what you remember of talks because you watch like a thousand talks. Obviously, you don't remember every talk. In that, t- I remember that Tony Robbins talk, and I specifically remember the Al Gore interaction. I don't really remember the before and after, <laughs> um, but let me, but it, but it does bring up the question of um, a lot of people in a lot of situations obviously work well with slides, and I'm I used to give a lot of talks with slides. I'm sort of of the belief now I don't like slides at all, hmm. even though many uh, this is not a, a, a criticism of anybody else. A lot of people are very successful with them. Steve Jobs certainly used them. Tony Robbins uses them. But it feels to me like um, the brain is multitasking when when the speaker uses slides. Like the listener has to multitask looking at the slides and the speaker. Sometimes, mm-hmm. and um, and th- there's definitely a trap there. There's no there's no rule on this. It's um, it's absolutely possible for certain people in certain circumstances to give a talk with no slides and and be riveting and to you know where it would have been a tragedy if they were to put something up. But many other talks need visuals to to really explain. Um, you know, there's there's different there's just different types of communication. And the great thing about a talk is you can use both visual communication and verbal communication. Hey, and, hey. and and the key the key is to plan it and, and not have like what what doesn't work is to have a really complex slide up while you're then trying to give a complex explanation that doesn't completely right. relate to what's on the slide and so forth. You you we encourage people to do. Try and do like one main idea on a slide that you want to communicate, um, and uh, you know, not do the thing that some scientists do and have you have like sort of four images all on one slide, as if we were still in an era where you know each slide cost each extra slide cost another five bucks or something like that. You know, you can just have four slides, not not one with four images, and and so make, making making uh, the visuals relate to what you're saying in a way that does not create cognitive overload matters but some some of um some talks are completely made by their visuals and it it, it just depends what you're trying to communicate like if you if you're if you're a, certainly if you're a visual artist or a designer or so forth you just you, showing your work maybe the single most important part of the talk in fact for for, for some artists and designers you actually don't want to even think of it as a talk. You want to think of it as you're showing your work, right? And your words are just there in the service of the images. Your words are like whispered captions and context setting. And it's not. In my next work, I sought out to define the context. Context of da 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 da. It's like no, just just show us why this matters, why you care about it. Show us the work. Be silent. Let people imagine that this is the best museum or e- exhibition hall you've ever brought an audience into and that you've owned their attention and let them see it. So uh, there's, there's, there's every case. And there's, there are talks with, that, that almost you want a blizzard of slides of just boom, 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 moving, moving quickly. And I, I actually like that. I've seen, um, the, I think the book Slideology discusses that as a style of slide use mm. of like doing a 30-minute talk with 200 slides. Uh, so I've tried that and it actually is fun. Like I like doing that because then again, it, people can't focus on the slides. They have to listen to you and it's part of the performance almost is to have all these slides in there. Yeah. Or or I like if I were, when I used to use slides, just having like one concept per slide. So it's not, there's no kind of overload. Yeah. Um, so, but it's interesting. I also like, and you've said it several times 
uh, you know, show us why this matters. It seems like the t- the speaker should throughout the talk is what you're saying is constantly ask themselves, show us, am I showing them why it matters to me? <laughs> like that is going to be key. I think that's right. I think that's right. One of Monica Lewinsky's nerve controlling techniques was just to write on her script in a, she in big letters, you know, this matters. And um and I I think that's I think that's actually true. It's like you you come out, you 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 this ultimately isn't about you. You're here in the service of something bigger than you are and you're passionate about it and you have this opportunity to share this thing. So so you know what you're saying, you know, it matters why it matters to you absolutely needs to come out. Why it should matter to anyone needs to come out. Well, and I like that she had, you mentioned she had two mantras, this matters and I got this. Right, right. <laughs> so right. to kind of say, say, if she ever gets nervous in the middle, I guess the idea is to remind herself that she's predetermined that she has this and she just needs a reminder of it. Yes. Uh, and, and I like that because it reminds me, I, I used to do um, CNB, CNBC spots about financial news and I would always get really nervous right before ending. You know, the lights turn off if you're in a studio and you're about to go on. And I would always kind of repeat to myself, okay, I'm just surrendering here. I, I want to be good for everybody listening. And I'm just going to surrender that I know what is good for people to hear. Well, I don't know if I did say anything good or not, <laughs> but that was what I would say to myself. So I, I think that's good. That, that surrendering kind of sort of... Um, outsources to a past version of myself in a weird way, the, the confidence that I'm about to need. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. I mean, look, every, everyone has a different way into this. There's no, in some things, there's no, um, there's no one solution. But, but for anyone nervous, anyone nervous should know that if you're nervous, you are not as nervous as Monica Lewinsky was coming to TED. Stakes were pretty high for her on that and um and she absolutely smacked it out of the park as she was a baseball match it was, well um yeah she might say that um i mean it was it was a spectacular talk and um you know I, I don't know how many i think more than 10 million people have seen it now and uh it's probably changed some of the culture on the internet not enough yet but but uh we we were very 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 Im- amazed and impressed to see how she she turned abject fear into a, an absolutely brilliant talk. So 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 final thing which is let's let's just touch on the conclusion of the talk. So here's where the magic trick has already sort of happened but maybe the audience isn't 100% aware that it's happened. You know the the magician's already done all the the kind of finger work he needs to do but the reveal hasn't uh, necessarily been cemented in the brains. Mm. Uh, what what's what, what are some tips you would give for concluding or or a checklist or things to think about? <laughs> I mean, I think in the book I give l- lots of ways to end a talk. Lots of ways you really shouldn't end a talk. And so, your so negative examples are great all throughout. And see, it's like like people. I mean, one of the most annoying things is people just drifting on and on, not knowing how to end it. You get multiple false endings where people just say, and so. It really has been wonderful being here today. And if, by the way, that, so just to emphasize this other point, and oh, that was so good. And by the way, thank you. For what you said, you know, they just go on and on. You like end the talk already. And, and it starts to suck away from the yeah. impact of it. Um, sometimes people never end with just like a, an emphatic, um, satisfying sort of final sentence. They go, and so that pretty much sums up, yeah, what I was thinking about this. And that, what a waste. You know, you've just spent, you know, maybe days preparing a talk and, you know, the last half hour giving it. And you can, that's your best shot at ending because pe- people remember endings. And there's no way that anyone's going to really burst into applause at that moment or whatever. But it's very important. So, there's a recency cognitive bias. People are going to remember <laughs> exactly. the end. And they're going to actually remember, even if your entire talk was bad, but your end was good, they're going to remember you as giving a good talk if your they, end is they, good. They may, they may well. And then the other thing that people do is, you know, they spend the last five minutes thanking all of their colleagues and all the rest of it, which, which is also exhausting. You, yes, you should honor them, but more important is to honor the audience. And, and th- that is not honoring the audience to do that. That is boring the audience. We don't know those people. Um, so, so, so I think, I think pe- you know, it depends on what the talk is. Like a talk that 
is presenting, uh, like sharing a new piece of work that you have something you've discovered or thought about, a natural way to to end is to show what this means. So, so what could this lead to? Well, here are three things it could lead to. Da, da, da. And uh, and if that happens, this will be the most exciting thing that's happened in my life. Or you know what? It, like just you, so that so there's the implications of the work. Um, then there could be a call to action from people. Um, if I have persuaded you that this matters, this is what I urge you to do mm. tomorrow. Do this tomorrow. Set out what that thing is. So there's the call to action. There's there might be um, a sort of uh, you know the big the next big unanswered question. Although that that may feel a, a little open. Sometimes speakers will set, give themselves a challenge. I stand. I'm here today telling you that I'm going to do this X. We had um, um, Bill Stone, um, who was a cave explorer, who came at the end of his talk and he pledged that he was going to take a team of explorers to the moon. You know, and he wanted to lead that team, and he was inviting people, and it was just, it was just a, it was just sort of a great triumphant. That, that ending. is a great way to end. Anyway, the the point is, it's think about your ending. Like if you if if you are going to remember any part of the talk, know the opening and know the ending. The last three or four sentences, know them. Like you, everyone you, can remember that, and because that that is what will give it impact. I, I also like what you just said though about Bill Stone because that gives a visual image as well. Right. So giving a visual image gives more excuses for other for people to remember what he just said. Yes. Uh, this I this unique thing of like a bunch of people, maybe me, um, exploring a cave on the moon. Right. <laughs> so like I just can't even you have to work to picture it, but everyone's going to, and then they'll remember it it, it, it gets stored back in more neurons, you know. Indeed. Indeed. So 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 um uh, first off, thank you so much uh for for coming and doing this podcast, like public speaking is such, uh, and, and communication in general is such an important part of my life. It's just been a pleasure to to ask you questions about it. I highly recommend your book. Tell me the subtitle again, because I always forget. <laughs> TED, TED Talks, the effective guide to giving a great TED Talk or something. <laughs> something like that. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Chris Anderson gives it, get, writes the, the, the key book on public speaking, which I can't remember the title of, but I but I have effectively remembered all the content, right? I brought up tons you've, of examples. You've, you've remembered, you've asked great questions. We've we've there's actually no need for anyone to buy the book now. You know, you've you've heard <laughs> No, it no, all. no. I will tell you what, I'll tell you why there's a need to buy the book. I'll tell you why there's an important need to reason to buy the book. I did not bring up the negative examples. So you um, gave many, here's four bad ways to give a talk. Oh, and by the way, one of them, I so 100% agree with because I'm seeing it in kind of the book publishing culture now on Overdrive, which is the inspirational talk. Oh, like yeah. the the, uh. the pseudo inspirational book is hitting like every genre of inspiration from self-help to, to business. I, I I hate it in a book. I hate it in a talk. And it's and, yeah. and you think to yourself, well, what about I have a dream? No, that's not what Martin Luther King was doing. <laughs> yeah, inspiration is is one of the most extraordinary things that there is. And I love the fact that people can be deeply inspired by a talk. But speakers whose goal is inspiration kind of make you want to throw up. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, and you the don't, fact you that don't, an industry around it is... Yeah, is, you don't inspire people by trying to be inspiring. You inspire people by being authentic, by doing something extraordinary, by being courageous, by, by being humble. It's, it's, a, it's, it's our biggest um, nausea at TED is being pitched by people who think that they're, they're going to inspire like some of the TED speaker inspires and and uh, we can't bear it and we say no to those people more. So, so... If you if you love the idea of standing, striding the stage and inspiring a million people, stop that for a bit. Go in and do something amazing with your life, and then just come and tell us about that. I like go. Okay, <laughs> call call to action. Call to action within the year. Go out and do something uh, amazing with your life. Doesn't even really matter what it is. You could be. Yeah. I'm going to be a garbage man for the next thirty days, and and then go to my job in a hedge fund and talk about the the difference, right. and uh, uh, and then give a talk about it. And 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 by the way, we didn't cover a lot of the things in your book, so so still get Chris <laughs> Anderson's book. And before you give the talk about being the difference between a garbage man and a hedge fund manager, and. Um, 
that really should have been my conclusion, but I'm I'm going to keep keep going for one more second. Um, if I want to do a TEDx, not speak, but if I want to throw a TEDx, uh, uh, what should I do? Yeah, so just Google TEDx application, and it'll it'll take you straight to the right page on our website, which explains how you apply for a TEDx license. I mean, it's it's a process, you know, that you need to. It, it's about doing an event in a specific location, you know, uh, around a specific theme. But and we get, we probably approve about a third of the licenses of the applications that come in. But we approve a lot. There's there's three and a half thousand of these every year, and we welcome people wanting to do this. It's a, it's a huge endeavor. So don't do it lightly. <laughs> Call to action. Call to action. Thank you, James. Well, thanks, Thank you. Chris. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. Bye. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network at jamesaltucher.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Hey, thanks for listening. Listen, I have a big favor to ask you and it will only take 30 seconds or less. And it would mean a huge amount to me. If you like this podcast, please let me know. Please let the team I work with know. Please let my guests know. And you can do this easily by subscribing to the podcast. It's probably the biggest favor you could do for me right now, and it's really simple. Just go to iTunes, search for The James Altucher Show, and click subscribe. Again, it will only take you 30 seconds or less, and if you subscribe now, it will really help me out a lot. Thanks again. Powered by Snapdragon, the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra elevates your photography to epic new heights. Snapdragon processors deliver a color experience like no other with sharp, industry-leading 8K video capture. You can also snap images in 200 megapixels, capturing more detail than ever. And those late-night blurry pics are a thing of the past thanks to next-level night mode. Experience powerfully moving premium photography only with Snapdragon. Follow us on Instagram at Snapdragon Official.